God, we pause to remember your presence and your closeness and your faithfulness. In the midst of the confusion, the chaos, we know that you are here today, even though we may not always feel like it. We ask that today that you would make your presence felt and known among us. And we ask that you would show us where you are at work in our lives and in the lives of others. God, we take time to confess that we do not always trust you. We have our own plans and our own agendas, and we have our own anxieties and worries, and we are tempted by the idea of being self-sufficient and the idea of running our own lives. We confess the areas of our lives that we have the illusion of control over, and we offer all of these situations to you. We continue to pray for our new pastor, that our, your Holy Spirit would be stirring in the midst of this time of transition for our community. And we pray for your prompting and your provision for them. We pray that we would continue to lean into this community, community, into our people, and that we would find a common ground in a world that is so divided. We pray for our city and our country and our world. While we might personally be struggling, help us to have the capacity and care to hold the burdens of others. As we see unrest happening in so many areas of the world, help us desire to know the names and the faces of these struggles. Help us to remember that there are real human beings attached to these places and spaces. And we thank you for the organizations that are doing good work in the midst of devastation and disaster. Lord, help us to choose you over ourselves, over our desire for a comfy and cushy life. Help us to know you in ways that make us want to go where you go, even if that means that we are choosing a life that is more complex and more messy. And help us to see the beautiful gift that it is to follow you in this life. We pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning, Lakeview. It's good to see all of you here. Someone thought I was you this morning, Lori. I took it as a great compliment. Yeah, I'm looking that good. Someone thought I was you. Uh, before we jump in back into our story, is our, our uh, sermon series on Restart, I want to remind you that we have offered some resources to help you as we go through this sermon series. And Alana has those recommended reads in the bookstore. So she has The Bible Unwrapped by Megan Good and inspired by Rachel Held Evans. But Jim went down to the States and he also got a couple of books that are out of print that are now available in the bookstore. So there are only a few copies. They're hot commodities. So go get one um, if you want one. The first one is God Stories by Shoemaker. And I love this book. It's a great book. So be the first one down the cattle chute. And the second one is Peculiar Treasures by Frederick Beekner. So if you would like one of those resources, go see Alana. Um, so today, we're going to get back into our series on Restart, and we're, we're going to be talking about Ruth. Now, I feel like I say this every week when I preach, but this is such a great story. 
go and read it. Like, I leave so much stuff on the cutting room floor when I do these sermons. There's just fabulous stuff in this book. And this book is really small. It's like four chapters. It's a standalone book. And it, unlike many of our stories of Restart, it's also a really happy story. So you might just need a little brightness in your life. So Ruth, while it fits in the trajectory of scripture, it's kind of set against the backdrop of the larger narrative of the nation of Israel. Um, Ruth itself focuses on a particular family. It's like the narrator is using a microscope. He's going in super, super close and taking a look at what it looks like in the ordinary life of one family in Israel. And this is the basic plot line. So a family leaves Bethlehem because of famine and they head to Moab. In time, the patriarch of this family dies, followed by his sons, who have married Moabite women in the meantime. And this leaves Naomi, the matriarch, and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, on their own. Now, Naomi hears that there's no longer a famine in Bethlehem, so she decides that she's going to head back there. And the story then continues to focus on this fantastic reversal of fortune that happens in this family, that this family experiences because of the decisions of Ruth, the daughter-in-law. And this is how the story starts. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with him. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah. That's where Oprah comes from. Did you guys know that? They spelled her name wrong on her birth certificate. And that's where Oprah comes from. Yeah. A little tidbit there for you. And the other woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both of the sons died, and this left Naomi alone with her two sons and her husband. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. So in the late afternoon one day this week, I set out for a walk. It was one of those really gloomy days, you know, the days where it feels like the sun didn't rise that morning. Uh, it was hard going, getting myself out the door, but I did. And when I was headed home, about 45 minutes later, the sun was starting to set and it dropped below the clouds on the western horizon. So as I was heading home, I was facing east and the sun hit the trees in my neighbor's yard the leaves were still on, these, on the trees, these red leaves, and it was like it just lit up. Ahead of me was this gloomy sky, but against that backdrop was this beautiful red tree, this beautiful flash of color. And this is a little bit like the book of Ruth. Ruth is like a glowing tree on the backdrop of a gloomy sky. Now, I know the story doesn't seem very bright, right now, but in these first few verses, we definitely see a reference to the gloom, to the background, to the backdrop. And this is hinted at in the very first verse. It says, in the days that the judges ruled Israel. So you might remember that we studied the book of Judges a little while ago. I feel like we were meeting in person. I couldn't really figure out exactly when we did that. Was that two years ago? Was it 10 years ago? Was it last week? It's so hard to figure it out these days, right? But anyway, we have studied the book of Judges. And if you might remember that Judges is a brutal book. Like the people of Israel, they've come into the land of Canaan and they decide that they're going to make their own rules and go their own way. And there's this continual downward spiral of the nation as they do what they want. And then, you know, God will raise up a judge and kind of get the chaos under control. And then the people go their own way and the spiral continues downward. And the book of Judges ends with a terrible act of violence and with these words. In those days, Israel had no king, and all the people did whatever was right in their own eyes. So in those days, Israel had no king. Just keep that in mind, because we're going to come back to that later. 
and everyone did whatever was right in their own eyes. It's a really dark time in the history of Israel. And in our English Bibles, Ruth actually comes right after the book of Judges. Judges is the backdrop narrative, the gloomy sky to the book of Ruth. And even though we don't see the equivalent quite yet of that bright red tree, as we continue to read, we see the sun peeking out a little bit in the book of Ruth. Listen to this. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. And then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up and be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' home, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and have a son, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else in the meantime? No, of course you wouldn't, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back, because wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. And when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So, Naomi gives her daughters-in-law an out in this passage. And this is because a woman's future, her safety, her provision in these days, was all tied up in the relationship she had with a man, whether that was her father or her brother or her husband. And in this story right now, there are no men. They're all gone. And so Naomi, knowing this, tells her daughters-in-law to go back to Moab. There they can find husbands, they can have babies, they can build a future. Orpah, she's convinced and she goes, but Ruth does not. She decides to stay with Naomi because of her loyalty, because of her faithfulness. And when we juxtapose this uh, decision of Ruth against the backdrop of Judges, the larger story of what is happening in the nation of Israel, we begin to understand that what the narrator is telling us here is that Ruth shows faithfulness that the nation does not. She is a foil for the nation of Israel. Unlike the nation in the book of Judges, Ruth does not do what is right in her own eyes. And by narrowing down to this particular story, the narrator is drawing attention to the fact that while the whole nation has gone rogue, there are still examples of faithfulness in the unnoticed and ordinary arenas of everyday life. So, I think often, we uh, think that the real action is happening in the large stories of our nation and of our world. And of course, that certainly matters because we can see even in this story how famine and chaos affect the everyday lives of people, just as war and famine and unrest and COVID and protocols all affect our lives and affect how we manage ourselves in the world. But the story of Ruth also reminds us that no matter what's happening on the world stage, on the larger stage, the power of faithfulness can still be a light and active in our ordinary, everyday lives. In times of chaos, the way to experience God's faithfulness and to practice faithfulness ourselves is to narrow our focus down and to pay attention to what is right in front of us. 
You see, in this story, Naomi and Ruth had very little agency. There was very little that they could control. But the narrator also brilliantly highlights the importance of their decisions, especially Ruth's decisions. First off, we see that the story starts with Elimelech. He's the main character. Uh, Naomi's husband is the center of the story. The scripture says a man of Bethlehem left with his family to go to Moab. But then when he dies, he becomes the husband of Naomi. Do you see the switch there? Instead of being the spouse, uh, Naomi becomes the one with the spouse. And then... The other two women, instead of being called the wives of the sons, they're named. Orpah is given a name and Ruth is given a name. Then the women begin to talk. In fact, the first person to speak in the book of Ruth is Naomi. It's a woman. And then they begin to make decisions. Little by little, the story narrows down to the women's agency to the decision-making potential that these women have. These decisions, theirs in particular, and mostly Ruth's, are the hinges on which the story turns. Their decisions matter. So we can't control the circumstances of the world right now, but we do have the power to decide how we're going to use the everyday gift of our everyday lives use our decision-making power to show faithfulness. Our ordinary everyday life is the place where we show our faithfulness to God and where we experience God's faithfulness to us. So how does God want to use your ordinary life to be like a red tree against the gloomy sky? How do you need to narrow your perspective right now in order to pay attention to what is right in front of you. Take a look at your ordinary everyday life. What marks the daily rhythms of your life? Where do you spend your time and energy? How do you love and respond to others? How do you love and respond to God? How do others love and respond to you? And how is God loving you and responding to you? Let me encourage you to use whatever agency you have. Some of you have lots. Some of you don't have very much. Your life is very boundaried, but it doesn't matter. Whatever decision-making power you have, it matters. Let me encourage you to use it for good right now. Um, we've been offering you all kinds of spiritual practices. That's one way that you can use your agency. Choose one. Integrate it into your life. Start with a prayer practice if you don't have one. Begin to read your Bible if you're not. Practice staying present to the people you love. Practice listening. Practice telling the truth. There are all kinds of ways that our everyday decisions help sustain faithfulness in us and help us become aware of God's faithfulness to us. Use whatever agency you have, however small it is, to live faithfully. Now, the story of Ruth not only highlights the centrality of faithfulness in our ordinary lives, it also challenges on a very deep level how we hold on, secure, on to security and how we might offer the things we find security in for love, for the sake of the world. And I just want to read one verse over again. Ruth 1.8, it said, uh, on the way, Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back to your mother's homes and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. And may the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. So notice the word here that Naomi uses for the way that her daughters-in-law treated her husband and their, their husbands and her. She uses the word kindness. Now, the Hebrew word for this word is hesed, and there's no real English equivalent. Sometimes in scripture, it's, uh, it's translated kindness, sometimes loving kindness, sometimes faithful loving kindness, sometimes commitment, loyalty. Um, but basically, what hesed means is faithful loving kindness in action over time. That's what hesed love is. It means commitment. It means love that never gives up. And it's the closest equivalent we have in the Old Testament to the word grace in the New Testament. And it reminds me of that theme verse that we started with 
in way back in September. Do you remember? Exodus 34, 6. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Hesed, that's God. And Naomi compares the faithful love of her daughters to this, this has said love of God, this loving kindness, this faithfulness of God. And then Ruth doubles down on that faithfulness by deciding to stay with Ruth. She says, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Now, these words take on even greater significance when we remember that a woman's security and provision was provided, remember, by men. To be a woman on your own was to be vulnerable. So Ruth attaches herself to a widowed woman, and she herself is a widow, she makes a crazy decision. Orpa actually makes the same decision. She makes the normal choice. She makes the choice that most of us would make if we were in that situation. And so Ruth is not just a counter example over and against the people of Israel in this dark time in history. She is an example of God's loving kindness and the ways in which that loving kindness upends and overturns and ignores the structures in which the people of that day found their security and provision. The words she uses in this passage actually echo the words of Genesis 2, when Adam wakes up to discover that God's created Eve out of his rib, and he says, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is someone I can commit to, someone I will cleave myself to. Ruth uses the same words that Adam uses. I will stay with you until death. We just hear the echoes of Adam there. She embodies hesed love, loyal, faithful love over time, love that never gives up. You'll remember, too, that when we started this series, we talked about the story of Abraham. You remember we talked about his genealogy and how his restart happened at the end of his genealogy? So it was like this man gave, uh, was the father to this man, and then that man was the father to that man, and that man was the father to Abraham, and Abraham was the father of no one, right? Because Sarai was barren and could have no children. So it was a risk for Ruth to attach herself to Naomi because hope, a future, was attached to progeny in the ancient Near, East. ancient Near East. Remember that about Abraham? It was like hopeless situation. No babies were coming. Women secured the future by giving birth. But Naomi gives up that potential when she joins with her mother-in-law. And even Naomi says that to her. She says, even if I got married tomorrow and then got pregnant and had a baby, you would have to wait until that baby grew up and then you wouldn't be able to have babies. Like, this is, this is a terrible decision. I can't give you a future. There is no life here. There is no potential. And this is what Phyllis Tribble says about Ruth. Ruth stands alone by the force of decision. Her choice makes no sense. It forsakes the security of a mother's house for insecurity abroad. It forfeits possible fullness in Moab for certain emptiness in Judah. It relinquishes the familiar for the strange. From a cultural perspective, Ruth has chosen death over life. One female has chosen another female in a world where life depends on men. Everything in this story pushes against the prescribed norms and structures of the world where the world found security. And Ruth does it for love, for Hesed. I wonder how Hesed love is asking us to step outside the secure structures and expectations that our world puts on us. Can I suggest? that for us as the church, 
the challenge might be to our sometimes idolatrous attachment to the nuclear family. First off, Ruth's story challenges the idea that it is only in partnering off in marriage that we experience and express committed love. And I actually believe that this is one of the reasons that marriages are just wearing out in our churches and in our world. It's because we put so much weight on those relationships. All of our needs and desires and our wants are fulfilled by this one special person who is made just for us. And it puts too much on one relationship and they give out, these relationships give out under the expectation and under disappointment and resentment. And the definition of family in the Christian story is larger than this. It is expanded, it is spacious. And we've given in to that idea that our families and homes are places that we retreat into to escape the world and to avoid risk. We put ourselves and our closest relatives at the center of our lives, and then we put four walls around us in order to protect us. It's called a home. And I think COVID has made it even worse. It has for me, anyway. It's made it harder. But Ruth challenges us to imagine a life where we commit to people outside of our biology, outside of our homes, to leave old ideas about what security and home are, and because of love, to open ourselves up in loving kindness to those who are different than us. We are called by love to be a family for those who have no family, who have no place, who have no security, and who have no future. Now, I want to tell you this morning that I am preaching this to myself as much as I am preaching it to you, because anybody who knows me well, including my home church, if they're here today, knows that I do not like it when people interrupt my alone time or come into my space when they're not invited. I have been known to do, like, hit the ground when someone does a pop-in, like, so they can't see me through the windows. Like, I've literally done that. Um, I am very protective of my home. I don't want to share my space. I want to control my time and my output of energy. So I feel the discomfort of my own words this morning. And I also want to tell you that I am not telling you to ignore your family for the sake of others. I am inviting you to imagine how you can invite others into the love of your family. Families are meant to be a loving community into which others are invited. Family is meant to open out, not close in. Families are meant to be vortexes of hospitality and love into which other people are drawn. So... What illogical choice might Jesus be asking you to make to bring life in a place or a person where you feel like there's no potential? And where do you feel resistance to surrender your trust in these structures or these places where you find safety, security that you don't want to share? It's okay. That, where, that feeling of resistance is the Holy Spirit working things out in us. It's okay to feel resistance. Maybe the first thing you need to do um, is to ask Jesus, who? Who is it? How? How can I do it? When? What? Just ask Jesus some of the questions of how he might be inviting you to open up your life in love, to risk your safety and security. Because the rest of Ruth's story actually reveals that when we join ourselves in love to another, potential blooms. Listen to this. So the two of them continued on their journey, and when they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The women asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord brought me home empty. So why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? 
So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the young Moabite woman. And they arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. So do you remember why Naomi and Elimelech left Bethlehem in the first place? because there was a famine, right? Um, and if, as we read chapter one, we just see this beautiful tension and like sort of contrast between fullness and emptiness. Um, it echoes all through that first chapter. So ironically, Bethlehem means house of bread, but they have to leave the house of bread because there is no bread. And when Naomi leaves, she leaves with a house full, right? She has a husband and two sons. They are fed while they're in Moab, but she also loses her whole family. So she's left this place because she can't feed her family, but now when Bethlehem is again full of bread, she comes back with nobody to feed. But the last verse of this chapter gives us a clue that the tension is going to be resolved. It says, they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. The narrator is setting us, up, setting us up. This seeming tragedy, this crazy notion of Ruth to follow Naomi, has more potential than we originally thought. The story is not over. A harvest is coming. Something more is ahead. In fact, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie yet, as we continue to read through the book of Ruth, what we discover is that Ruth's loving kindness, this hesed, this openness to the stranger and to the vulnerable, actually becomes the engine, the energy that propels the plot line along. So, hesed love causes Ruth to attach herself to Naomi, to cling to her, even though she offers no future and no potential. But later, Ruth finds a husband, Boaz, but he takes special attention, pays special attention to her because of her faithfulness to Naomi. And then in response to her faithfulness, not only to Naomi, but to him, he shows faithfulness to her. He marries her and she has a son. And Shoemaker, from that book, God Stories, calls this a contagion of kindness it grows and grows and grows. And this has a profound effect on history. Listen to the end of the book of Ruth. Boaz and Ruth named their son Obed, and he became the father of Jesse, the father of David. He became the father of King David. Do you remember that last verse in Judges that I told you to take note of at the beginning of our sermon? In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Ruth does not do what is right in her own eyes. She instead becomes this visible sign of God's faithful love in her commitment and kindness to Naomi. She commits her ordinary life to the risky, vulnerable path, and it yields extraordinary outcomes. Israel gets a king. She becomes the great-grandmother of David. This hesed love reverses in time the slow roll of Israel into chaos. It is an extraordinary reversal of fortune, not just for Ruth and her family, but for the whole nation of Israel. When we use our ordinary, faithful lives when we open them up to the larger story of God's faithful love, we become a part of this large story of God renewing all things. There are so many things in the world right now that we want to fix. Problems we want to overcome, situations we want to transcend, chaos we want to calm. The world feels overwhelming, but we are not called to control those things. We don't even need to fret about them because Ruth teaches us that God's way of bringing renewal in those places too large for us to manage or control is by our faithful living. What if the transforming power of hesed love is set loose in the world 
through our ordinary everyday lives as we use whatever agency we have to live faithfully? What if the way that God does his work is through us as we let go, as we give up security, as we offer the closest and most sacred parts of ourselves for the sake of love? So narrow your focus, stay faithful, open your arms and heart and lives to the ones who need it most. This will take courage, but it will be the way that you will join God in the renewal of all things. Thank you.